We're going to continue in our series on the fundamentals of right division, and it's been about a month since we've taught in this series, and uh, just various things uh, came up, and uh, for various reasons, I didn't intend to take such a long break, so uh, I thought we'd teach on it in Sunday school this morning, since we're not having the afternoon service this afternoon, and we need to get back to this series, and hopefully next week... Uh, in the afternoon service, we'll pick it up and we'll actually be getting into the right division. This is all, the first several lessons have been uh, foundational and introductory, but we'll begin focusing in on rightly dividing. But uh, in our last lesson, we discussed the importance of believing that we have the word of truth. Paul said, rightly dividing the word of truth. Believing the Bible and rightly dividing it go hand in hand. I mean, after all, what is the point in studying the Bible if it isn't even trustworthy, if it's not the word of truth? But since it is the word of truth, in what way could we better spend our time than in studying God's word? It's the only perfect thing on planet Earth, the word of God, and it has eternal value. What you learn in the word of God is eternal. There's no better way to spend time, and the Bible tells us to redeem the time. And one of the best ways we can do that is spending time in God's Word. Now, not just reading it and studying it, believing it and allowing it to work effectually in us, as Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 2.13. But believing the Bible is the foundation for real Bible study. Um, don't change the words to line up with your understanding. Change your understanding to line up with the words. Believe the Bible. There's a lot of people trying to study the Bible don't even believe it. And then when they come to something they don't understand, they try to change it, try to mess with it. No, just believe it for what it says. And when you don't understand something, just believe it and keep studying it. And uh, later on, you might receive more light on it. None of us have it all figured out. We're all learning and growing. And so always believe it for what it says. Okay, just don't. And, and the only way, by the way, you can let it say what it says, and it makes sense, is to rightly divide it. Because a lot of people don't rightly divide it. That's one of the reasons why they get into trying to change it to line up with their understanding. If you rightly divide it, it'll make perfect sense for what, it, and you can just leave it like it is and not try to change it. For an example, I always use this example when I'm talking like this about this matter. Of, in Mark 16, there's this commission concerning the kingdom. And a lot of people don't really understand the passage. And uh, those that are honest know that we're not following that, although a lot of people claim that's our commission. Of course, we understand it's not. But you look at the things said in there, those who are honest say, you know, we're not doing any of that. So the way a lot of people try to get around the passage is say, well, it doesn't even belong in the text. It's not in some of the ancient manuscripts. <laughs> They literally tried to remove the whole passage, the whole ending of Mark 16 from verse 9 to the end of the book, the end of the chapter. They tried to omit it. And the modern versions don't have the audacity yet to take it out, but they'll put a note in there and says, you know, shouldn't be in there, cast doubt on it. And, uh, well, if you just rightly divide, that commission makes perfect sense in its dispensational context concerning the kingdom. So be a Bible believer. That's foundational to Bible study. Now, the focus in this series is on the main key to Bible study. In the one verse where we are told to study the Word, we're told exactly how. It is the main key, 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. That's going to be the focus in this series. That's why we're calling it Fundamentals of Right Division. But first... We've been laying some groundwork and some introductory things and, um, you know, some foundational things. And we can go on more, but we're about to get ready to get into the right division. But, but, but today I want to talk about some basic rules of Bible study that will help us use that main key. And I've got ten. I'm not, I don't think we're going to get all ten today. We'll see what happens. I, I'd be very surprised if I got all ten in. Maybe we'll call this the Ten Commandments of Bible study. Uh, but if you will follow these ten that we're going to talk about, it will help you immensely in rightly dividing. 
Now, I encourage you, I'm going to put them on the board as we go along. I encourage you to write these down and to implement this. Hopefully, you're already doing these things, but be mindful of it. Be conscious of it. Purposely implement these things into your Bible study. You know what? You might believe the Bible, but you still won't understand it if you don't study it God's way. There's a lot of people that sincerely believe the Bible but they're greatly hindered in understanding it because they're not rightly dividing it. It's not enough to be biblical. You've got to be dispensational. You've got to be biblical and dispensational. It starts with believing the Bible, but there's more to it than that. You've got to study it God's way. For an example, tongues, speaking with tongues is in the Bible. And I've talked to people who said, look, it's in the Bible. I believe the Bible. The Bible said to speak with tongues. Yeah, but that's not dispensational for today. That's not God, what God's doing today. And if you rightly divide, you'll understand it. There's a lot of things that are in the Bible that we're not doing today. And the reason is understanding uh, the dispensation in which we're living. And uh, so it's not enough just to be biblical. You've got to be dispensational. So the first thing uh, is to depend on the Spirit of God. Very simple, but I want to put this on here. You gotta depend on the Spirit of God if you're gonna study the Word of God. Look in Ephesians 1. Ephesians chapter 1. The Scripture is made up of spiritual words that are only discerned, that are only understood by the Spirit of God enlightening your spirit to them. A lost man can pick up the Bible and try to read it. He might get some surface things, but he'll never get the real spiritual truth out of it without the Holy Spirit enlightening his understanding. In Ephesians 1, and by the way, when you get saved, you're brought out of darkness into light, but even believers can be blinded to some truth because we need to walk in the light. We're in the light, but we need to walk in it as far as practically. And so just because you're saved doesn't mean now you understand the whole Bible. You've got to grow in your understanding. And if you cling to traditions of men and you don't have a believing heart toward God's Word, uh, there's a lot of things you're not going to see. So we know a lost man can't see spiritual truth until he believes the gospel is brought out of darkness and the light. But even saved people, because of the flesh, I mean, they're in the light as far as they're standing, but that doesn't mean they're walking in the light as far as their state. And so even saved people can be blinded to some things. And that's what Paul's praying for here. Save people to see some truth. Ephesians 1 verse 15, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and loved all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. Not new revelation. The Bible's a complete revelation but spiritual revelation to that which has been revealed in the Word of God, it needs to be revealed to our understanding. It's all about the knowledge of Him. Okay, That's the most important thing, the knowledge of God. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. He's talking to believers. There's a lot of people that read the Bible that don't really understand it. He said, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. So the Bible says in Psalm 119, 130, the entrance of thy words giveth light. It giveth understanding to the simple. So the light is understanding. Spiritual understanding. The entrance of thy words. Not just hearing it, but receiving it with a believing heart. That you may know what is the hope of his calling. You know, there are a lot of believers. I mean, they're saved, and they are clueless about the hope of the body of Christ. They, they think that they have Israel's hope. They talk about inheriting the earth. They, they talk about things that God promised Israel. They don't know what, what he's given the body of Christ, which is higher. We have a hope in heavenly places. And... Most professing Christians today don't have any idea concerning our rapture before 
the 70th week of Daniel and what all that entails. They're so blinded to it and they need to be enlightened. Look in um, 1 Corinthians 2, if you would please. So all believers have the Spirit of God. If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. So he's in there, and one of the main things is he wants to teach you God's Word. He wants you to understand God's Word. So you got to yield to the Spirit. you got to be submitted to His authority by believing His Word that He inspired. Believing the words of God. If you don't believe the words he inspired, he's not, you know, you're not in submission to the Spirit of God. You've got to believe his word, depend on him. That's the only way you're going to have spiritual understanding. It doesn't come through academics. It doesn't come through man's education. You need to be spirit taught. Okay, And I'm not against education if it's the right kind. But there's a lot of people spending a lot of money on the wrong kind. And as far as I'm concerned, it's a big waste of money. But nothing wrong with education. Just make sure you get the right kind of education. And when it comes to the Bible, the best thing to do is be a Bible student, letting the Bible interpret itself, believing the Bible, and not taking man-made rules to the Bible. And the rules we're giving are all Bible-based. You, 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 any believer that can read, can be a real Bible student. You don't have to go to a seminary or whatever. You just got to be a Bible believer and study the book. 1 Corinthians 2, verse number 6. Uh, Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, the perfect being spiritual saints that are mature, rooted and grounded in the faith, yet not the wisdom of this world nor of the prince of this world that come to naught, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world in our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. And a lot of people stop reading there and say, see, you just never can know it all, so... Or they'll say, this is talking about heaven and we'll never really know until we get there. Well, that's true. We won't really know until we get there. But God has given us some things in his word about it. But this is in the context is not talking about heaven. He's saying you can't know the spiritual things of God through your human ability. Whether, you know, with your human eyes and your human ears and your human heart. You can't know them that way. But, verse 10, but God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit. You can know it by the Spirit of God enlightening you to this. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. And that hidden wisdom, that mystery concerning the body of Christ is one of those deep things. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him, even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. I mean, that, that's clear. You can't relate to another man if you don't have the spirit of man. Now, we all have a human spirit, but when we get saved, God's spirit moves in. And through God's spirit, we can know the things of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know. He wants us to know the things that are freely given us of God, which things also we speak. Not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth. Where do you find the words that the Holy Ghost teacheth? That's the scriptures. All scriptures given by inspiration of God. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. The natural man who's never been regenerated, he's, he doesn't have the Spirit of God, he can't possibly know the things of God. But we who have the Spirit of God, if we're spiritual, we're yielded to the Holy Spirit, we can know them. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? Well, we can't know it unless he reveals it, and he has. He said, we have the mind of Christ. This book is the mind of Christ. It's not everything he knows, but it's everything we need to know and that he wants us to know. And we can know these things. You know, in Acts chapter 8, the eunuch, the Ethiopian eunuch, was reading from Isaiah. And Philip comes up to him and says, 
understandest thou what thou readest? He said, how can I? <laughs> Except some man guide me. Well, he needed a spirit-filled man like Philip to teach him. But you and I who have the Spirit of God in us, it's good to have teachers also if they're teaching us the truth, but we can personally study the Bible and understand it because we have the Spirit of God. I mean, that's a good question you can ask a lot of people going to church this Sunday morning. Understandest thou what thou readest? I mean, it's, reading the Bible is one thing, understanding it's something else. And once you start understanding it, then you'll read it a lot more. And, and it's a fascinating thing. It's a wonderful thing to learn God's truth. All right, number two, um, take the words in their normal and literal sense. Normal and literal approach to the Bible. The Bible means what it says and says what it means. In Mark 12, it says the common people heard him gladly. Talking about the Lord Jesus. And Jesus Christ is the Word. He is the Word of God. The incarnate Word. Here's the inspired Word. The common people God wrote this book for the common people. The King James Bible, by the way, is they put it in a computer program one time and said it was like fifth or sixth grade reading level. The average word, if you take all the words and average it out, the average word is five letters. People say, well, I can't understand thee and thou. I wouldn't go around telling that to people. Because that's like saying, I am ignorant. <laughs> it's not that hard. Just because we don't use those words doesn't mean you can't understand them. They're not difficult. But even that's so important because you in the King James Bible is always plural. We use it today, singular. But thee and thou and thine, that's singular. You and ye, that's, all, that's plural and that's important. And God chose this form of English for a reason. It's the pinnacle. It doesn't get any better. And that's not even necessarily how they spoke in 1611, by the way. But God chose this English. I have never heard anybody complaining about Shakespeare. Nobody ever says, update Shakespeare. You would ruin Shakespeare to update Shakespeare. They say it's standard English. This is better than Shakespeare. <laughs> yeah. Well, you can take it in its normal and literal sense and understand it. Now, the Word of God uses some figurative, symbolic, and allegorical language. Yes, that's true. But most of it is written in normal, plain, literal language. Paul said, we use great plainness of speech. 2 Corinthians 3.12 Paul said, the Spirit speaketh expressly. That means plainly and directly. We must always take the words in their normal and literal sense unless it is clearly not possible to do so. And the figures of speech and the symbols and the allegories are obvious in the Bible. Okay? But the far majority of it is plain literal language. Look, when Christ said, I am the door, He wasn't saying He was literally a wooden door on hinges. It's obviously a figure of speech. That's clear. That's obvious. Words have meaning, but the allegorical approach, which is so common in religion, claims the Bible doesn't mean what it says. Look in Luke chapter 1. I'll give you an example. The allegorical approach says this is what the Bible says, but here's what it really means. And they give it a meaning other than what it says. And they call it spiritualizing. It's not very spiritual to mess with the Word of God. J.C. O'Hare said, Those who spiritualize the Scriptures lack spiritual eyes, and therefore they tell spiritual lies. To say the church today is Israel is a lie. They get that way by spiritualizing. They call it. It's not spiritual to do that. If words have any meaning... The church today cannot be Israel because the church today is called the body of Christ, a new creature, wherein there is neither Jew nor Gentile. In, in Galatians 6, Paul contrasts the Israel of God with the new creature. It's not the same. okay? And yet, the far majority of people in religion today think we're Israel. 
It's called replacement theology, and it is foundational to all manner of bad doctrine. That's a Roman Catholic doctrine. And yet, Baptists today are really getting into that replacement theology. You're seeing it more and more. It's always been Catholic, Protestant, but now there's even fundamental Baptists that are teaching replacement theology. I know a guy that I went to uh, college with. He's a Baptist pastor that teaches replacement theology. It's sad, isn't it? Luke chapter 1. And you come to this. Look, look at the plain words. I should have turned there myself. I told you to turn and I didn't. Luke 1 verse uh, 31. Look at the plain words. And uh, he shall, uh, and behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb. Of course, the angel talking to Mary. And bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Where was the throne of David? It was on earth in Jerusalem. And Christ is not on the throne of David right now. He's seated with his father in his father's throne. But he will come back and sit on the throne of David in his second coming. But he's talking about a literal throne on the earth. And he's talking about a literal kingdom on the earth. And he's talking about Israel, Jacob, a literal nation. And the spiritualizers come in here and say, this is being fulfilled right now. Jesus is on the throne of David and we're Jacob. That's nonsense. You understand? And that's the way religion teaches that. So you, if you read the plain words, it's clear what it says. But the allegorical approach says, oh, it doesn't mean what it says. Let me tell you what it means. I heard a Church of Christ so-called preacher say literally about the book of Revelation. He said, now when you come to the book of Revelation, when you read it, you say, okay, this is what it says, but what does it mean? Because it does not mean what it says. And they teach that the book of Revelation was fulfilled in 70 A.D. It was all fulfilled in the first century. You can't be a real Bible believer and think that way. Clearly, there are many things in the book of Revelation. Look, the whole book is future. It hadn't been fulfilled, yet it will be after this age. But they try to put it in the past. This approach, the allegorical approach, it attacks the clarity of God's Word. It says it doesn't mean what it says. It attacks the authority of God's Word. Because you, you know what? Then you've got to go to these preachers and ask them what it means. Because you can't understand it for what it says, so then you've got to look to the leaders in religion, and they'll tell you what it means. And then it attacks the integrity of God's Word, because they're saying God, did, God promised Israel some things that He went back on, and He's doing something else spiritually. <laughs> It attacks the clarity, authority, and integrity of God's Word. Take the words in their normal and literal sense. Number three, the Scriptures are self-interpreting. The Scriptures are self... Did I spell that wrong? <laughs> I can't talk and write at the same time, you know. You know, what's sad is most of you probably didn't even know if that was wrong or not. Man, I'm just kidding. That's a joke. Self-interpreting. Here's the thing. I appreciate Tanya. She's about the only one who ever laughs at what I say, you know. <laughs> That's why the Lord sent her <laughs> to be a, an encouragement. <laughs> and the donuts. She brings the donuts. Those two things, you know, we'll keep you. All right. <laughs> 2 Peter 1.20 says, No prophecy of the Scriptures of any private interpretation. Okay, the scriptures are self-interpreting. There is only one right interpretation of every passage. People say, well, there's many interpretations. That's just your interpretation. No, there's no such thing as my interpretation. Your interpretation, if it's my interpretation, if it's your interpretation, is wrong. The only interpretation that's right is God's interpretation. God never gave us the right to interpret the scripture not our place to interpret the Bible. Joseph said, do not interpretations belong to God? Genesis 40 verse 8. The living word of God interprets itself as we study it God's way. Look at Revelation 17 for an example. You can just forget all the man-made rules of hermeneutics. You say, what's hermeneutics? I don't know. <laughs> Obviously. No, it's just 
science of interpretation, you know, and they, you go into these theological books and they try to wax eloquent on all this. Just forget all that. Just the Bible will interpret itself if you study it God's way. If you believe it and rightly divide it and compare Scripture with Scripture, the Bible will interpret itself. Look, you come into Revelation 17 and, you know, you've got this passage that gives this symbol of this harlot on a beast and uh, I'm not going to read all of it for time but you look at the description of it and you think now what does that represent and 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 but you don't need to try to figure out what it represents because you're told in verse 7 and the angel said unto me wherefore didst thou marvel I will tell thee the mystery of the woman okay I'm going to tell you and he goes on and explains it you don't have to interpret it. It's interpreted for you. And I would venture to say the far majority of even fundamental dispensational Bible con commentators are going to tell you that <clears throat> this, um, this is uh, Rome here, that Babylon is Rome. That's a, that's a private interpretation because that's not what the Bible says. Look in verse 5, and upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Now, Rome is not the mother of harlots. She's a daughter. The Roman Catholic Church is in this Babylonian religion, but it's not the fountainhead. It's just one of the streams. He said, mystery, comma, Babylon the Great. All of these commentators say, mystery, Babylon. And then they say, it doesn't mean Babylon, it means Rome. He said, Babylon. It's mystery, comma, Babylon the Great. And then the last verse says, verse 18, The woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. And that's Babylon. It goes all the way back to Nimrod. And you could study that out. And it's people talked about the revived Roman Empire. No, it's the revived Babylonian Empire. That's the issue in Revelation. So the scriptures are self-interpreting. Don't isolate a text and try to interpret it yourself. The Bible interprets itself for you. Never build a doctrine on an isolated text. Very dangerous. A lot of people will try to go in the Bible and prove some kind of doctrine, and they'll take one verse out of context, isolate it, and use it as a, as a proof text. And that's always wrong. The scriptures are, When you study the Bible God's way, it interprets itself. Number four, compare. Compare Scripture with Scripture. We saw it in 1 Corinthians 2.13. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Well, we must search the Scriptures. That's what we're told to do. Search the Scriptures. And you've got to search it because one verse or passage will shed more light on another. That's the way God wrote it, for a reason. And you're going to have to compare. You're going to have to cross-reference. And the Bible has an amazing cross-referencing system where when you learn how to do that, it interprets itself to you. So God wrote the Bible in such a way that we're going to have to search the Scriptures if we're going to learn His truth. Learning how to cross-reference is absolutely essential in Bible study. Uh, I'll just take a couple examples out of the first chapter in Genesis 1 where... In verse 2, it says, the earth was without form and void. Now, what does that mean? Is, is that the way God created it? Well, I, I need to look for another reference. What is, that, what is without form and void? How does the earth get that way? Yeah, well, I go to Jeremiah 4.23. There's only one other reference that says without form and void. And it's talking about the earth as a result of God's judgment. And it's a future judgment, but yet the principle is it's judgment that makes the earth without form and void. That's how you cross-reference. And then, you know, Genesis 1, God told Adam, replenish the earth. Well, I wonder what he meant by that. Well, there's only one other time. It says replenish. Now it says replenished, but only one other replenish is in the Bible, and it's what God told Noah after the flood. That what he told Noah after the flood is similar to what he told Adam after the flood. 
Okay, and you get understanding by cross-referencing. Comparison, comparison. The comparison that transformed the way I study the Bible is when I, and I tell, I tell you this often, it's very key, but the comparison that really transformed my Bible study was Acts 3.21 and Romans 16.25. Peter said to the men of Israel that what he was talking about was spoken by the prophets since the world began. Paul said to the Gentiles in Romans 16, this was kept secret since the world began. And that language, spoken since the world began, secret since the world began, there's your main division. The kingdom program, the mystery program. Once I saw that, that is how you rightly divide. Number five, you got to distinguish... Interpretation and application. You've got to distinguish interpretation and application. When it comes to understanding the Bible, it is vital we know the difference between interpretation and application. Interpretation is simply the right and proper explanation of what's written. It's to expound. To expound is to unfold, to open the text in strict accordance with its context. In Nehemiah 8, verse 8, uh, they were reading the Word of God. It says uh, to Israel there, when they had come back into the land uh, under Nehemiah's leadership and all of that, Nehemiah 8, 8, uh, it, they read in the book of the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. Uh, in Luke 24, Jesus expounds some of the prophecies to disciples that says he opened their understanding, that they might understand the scriptures. To expound it is to, to, to unfold it, to open it, that we might understand it. Every passage has one right interpretation, but it may have more than one application in a spiritual sense, a secondary sense. But you know what's so sad is most people take application to be the interpretation. And very few people today study the Bible for doctrinal interpretation. They use it for devotions, and all they want to do is find an application. The applications are good, and they're there. But you better first learn the interpretation, otherwise you might make the wrong application. Bullinger wrote this. The interpretation of a passage belongs to the occasion when and the persons to whom or of whom the words were originally intended. When that has been settled, then it is open to us to make application of those words to ourselves or others so far as we can do so without coming into conflict with any other passages. In other words, once you understand the interpretation, you might make an application so long as it doesn't contradict sound interpretation. Number six. The Word of God uh, has its own built-in dictionary. Use it. Okay? That's an R. I know it's not very good. My penmanship is not what it needs to be. The Word of God has its own built-in dictionary. So don't rely on man-made definitions to understand Bible words. All the words in the Bible can be understood by studying the Bible itself. You don't have to look outside of the Bible to understand the Bible. No need to look to outside sources to understand Bible words. You don't need a man-made dictionary and lexicon because how do you know those definitions are right? Believe the pure words of the King James Bible where God has preserved His words for us in the English language and don't rely on man-made definitions. All right, how do, you, how do you do this? Let me give you a couple things real quick. First of all, look a good couple things, and I'm not going to write this, but you might want to write this down. Four things quickly. Um, look up the first mention of the word. That's always helpful. What does the word worship mean? There's a lot of people talking about that today. you got worship leaders and worship singers and... Worship, worship, worship. Well, what does it mean? Genesis 22, 5 is the first reference. Why don't you go home and study that and see what you can learn from it. It had to do with Abraham offering up his son Isaac. 
That's, does that sound like, you know, do you think Abraham had his hands in the air and waving like he just don't care? and all, <laughs> Having a party in Jesus' name, you know, jamming for the lamb. And, no, he, it was sacrifice. It was obedience. God was worthy of that. Now, there's a lot we can talk about, but the first mention will help you with, a lot with that. By the way, that same passage is the first mention of love in the Bible. All right. Consider the word in context. If you will just pay attention to the words around the word, you can often understand the word. The word conversation, for an example today, we usually take it to mean words, speaking words. But in 1 Peter 3, it says, Likewise, you wives, be in subjection your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. So without the word, without them speaking, they can win their husbands by how they live. He said, while they behold your chaste conversation, they behold it. They don't hear it, they behold it. Conversation is your manner of life. That's easy when you look at the words in the Bible. Parallelism. Parallelism. That means God will often, in the, in the text, draw parallels to help you understand the word. What does the word fellowship mean? What well, means you eat fried chicken together in the fellowship hall? <laughs> That's not a bad idea, but that's not. You know, fellowship is 2 Corinthians 6.14. Uh, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness. So what concord, what part, what agreement. He uses all these words parallel. So fellowship has to do with communion. It has to do with concord. It has to do with agreement. You look at the parallels. And then again, check the cross-references. Check the cross-references. Um, we looked at one, I think, last Sunday in our message in 1 Timothy 2. Paul said he was ordained a preacher, teacher, apostle of the Gentiles. That's 1 Timothy 2.7. 2 Timothy 1.11 says he was appointed the same thing. So he's saying the same thing. In one verse he says ordained. The other one he says appointed. The cross-reference teaches you that ordained is to be appointed. And it's like that. I mean, so if you will look up the first mention, if you'll consider the word in its context, if you'll note parallels and check cross-references, you'll understand the words in the Bible. The King James Bible will make you smarter. It will. If you will study the King James Bible, your education, uh, you, you'll get smarter <laughs> just by being a Bible reader. No wonder why our culture is so stupid, right? <laughs> Number seven, context. And these aren't in any particular order. They all go together. Context, context, context. The Bible is not a collection of sayings where you just, you just go in there and lift a saying out and say, here it is. This is no, everything has a context. All the false teachers use the Bible. They just use it out of context. You can make the Bible say anything if you take it out of context. Jesus said, hang the law and the prophets. That's what he said. Did you know Jesus said, you know what? Hang the law and the prophets. He said, on these two commandments, hang the law and the prophets. He, you don't get that. It's okay. Um, context. You can lift things out and make it say something it's not saying. Don't proof text. Most people proof text. They already believe something and they go to the Bible to try to find a verse to back it up and they lift it out of context and twist it and make it back up what they're saying. That's always wrong. Consider each passage in the light of its dispensational context. Is this prophecy or mystery? Then what is the context of this book? What is the context of this chapter? What is the immediate context of what I'm reading? Classic example uh, that I just recently was dealing with is people trying to take Psalm 93 to teach that the earth is flat. Yes, there are people today that think the earth is flat. But anyway, it uh, takes all kinds to make the world go round. Never mind, it doesn't go round. It's stationary. It's flat. It has a dome over it. You know. Anyway, Psalm 93 is not talking about... The earth literally not moving is talking about the kingdom age. It's a prophecy of the kingdom age. It has nothing to do with what they're trying to make it say. Which, by the way, even if the earth was stationary, it wouldn't mean it's flat. But anyway, context. 
Coverdale, in, his, in the Coverdale translation, and he lived from 1488 to 1569, one of the early English uh, Bibles, Coverdale Bible, in the preface it says, It shall greatly help ye to understand Scripture if thou mark not only what is spoken or written, but of whom and to whom, with what words, at what time, where, to what intent, with what circumstances, concerning what goeth before and what followeth after. <laughs> Pay attention to what you're reading. Number eight. I'm going to try to finish this, if that's all right. Progressive revelation. Always keep in mind the scriptures were given by progressive revelation. That's dispensational truth. A biblical dispensation is marked by, what, by God dispensing new revelation that brings about a change in how he's dealing with man. So the Bible wasn't revealed all at once. Keep in mind it was revealed progressively. So don't read truth from one passage back into another before it was revealed. There is a baptism by one spirit in one body. That was revealed through Paul. Why do everybody, everybody wants to read that in Acts 2. That's not Acts 2. That's not what was happening in Acts 2. The baptism with the Holy Ghost according to prophecy is not the baptism by one spirit into one body according to the mystery. That's two different things. Progressive revelation help you understand that. Never read a passage. See, the Bible is a complete revelation, so we have a tendency to take something revealed here and read it back to a passage when it wasn't revealed. And people are mixing the word of truth instead of rightly dividing it. Progressive revelation, that is dispensational truth. Number nine, consider. Paul said, consider what I say, and the Lord give the understanding in all things. 2 Timothy 2.7. You're going to have to consider what Paul said first. Consider what Paul said first. In other words, since the Apostle Paul is the divinely appointed spokesman for this present age of grace, we have to consider what he says first if we're going to understand the Scriptures. You cannot possibly, un follow, you cannot possibly follow everything this Bible says to do. If you try to obey all the things this Bible tells people to do, you would be so confused. and I mean, it wouldn't work. Not everything in this Bible is spoken to you. It's not all given for you to do. So you need to follow what Paul says first. Follow the doctrine and example of Paul that Christ gave us for this age. You can't follow Christ if you don't follow his spokesman. Christ raised him up, and I'm not going to, you know all the verses Paul said, follow me, again and again. It's not about him as a man, but Christ in him and through him. So we should only apply what lines up with Paul's teaching for the body of Christ. In other words, I can make applications throughout the scripture, but I, if something doesn't line up with what Paul said for this age, then I, I don't follow that. I have to follow what Paul said for this age. You understand? Consider what he said first, the Lord will give. Because that's where we're living. We're living in this age where Paul is speaking, so that's how we understand. And lastly, well, I can't believe I got ten points done, but I did. Miracles still happen, evidently. And I, I don't have to talk about this because this is where we're going to pick it up the whole rest of our series. Look at that E. Is that not terrible? Good night. Rightly divide. That, that See, all this... Depending on the Spirit, taking it normal and literal, and for what it says, understanding the Bible interprets itself, comparing Scripture with Scripture, knowing the difference between interpretation and application, using the built-in dictionary, considering the context, noting progressive revelation, considering what Paul says first. If you do all that, you're on your way to rightly dividing the word of truth. You know what rightly dividing all comes down to? Studying the Bible in context. Studying it the right way. And so that is the key to Bible study, and that's exactly what we need to, uh, uh, to emphasize if we're going to understand the Scriptures. And so the rest of our lessons in this series will be on how to rightly divide the Word of Truth. Let's pray. Father, thank you.